Today we, we have been covering the book of Jose, and we're going to continue on with that. Uh, the first night that we had covered, if y'all weren't here or if you don't remember, you should take notes <laughs> just to make sure. But the first night we kind of covered the first three chapters, and it talked about how much God had a jealous love over us. And because he was jealously in love with us, when we start chasing after all those false lovers who lead us astray, to, who will lead us straight to hell, he will chase, he will go ahead and he will bring correction. Just like we, you know, parents would correct the kids, right? You don't correct them because you just want to be some kind of mean guy. You correct them, you tell them don't play in the road because you don't want them to get run over, right? And it's the same thing with God. When he corrects us, we need to realize that he's treating us as sons and daughters. And so when we get this correction, when God corrects us, we need to be thankful to God. We need to tell him, thank you, Lord, for loving me enough that you're going to tell me, don't do this. Thank you for loving me enough that when I mess up, the Holy Spirit convicts me. Thank you, Lord, for that. And we had seen how he corrects, how he does it. You know, he'll sit there and if we start chasing after all these things and leave, forsaking him, he goes ahead and he tells us, you know, what? hey, come on, come back. And if we don't listen, then he winds up making our path a bit harder to go, the chasing after these false lovers. And then if we continue on, guess what? We will never be able to reach those lovers. And then he will strip us of everything that we had gotten. That, you know, he will wind up making it so that we are laid open and bare. And he will wind up doing this because he wants us to realize that, you know what, hey, it was better when we were walking with God than trying to walk with the world. And so he want, once we're laid open and bare, he goes ahead and he starts calling us back. And, you know, he's like, you know, what, hey, come on, let's let's reason together. But he doesn't immediately pour out the blessings on us, does he? No, because he wants to see if you want him for him or you want him just because of what he can do for you. When we can get to the point where we seek after God and we say, thank you, God, for being you. Thank you for giving me you. That's when we can finally get it. Instead of, oh, thank you, Lord, for blessing me with this, blessing me with this, blessing me with that. And if you don't bless me with those things, I won't thank you. No, when we realize that and we need to seek the face of God instead of his hand, Amen. then we get it. And that's what he wants. I mean, we don't want somebody to get into a relationship with us uh, who just wants and wants and wants and wants, wants, right? Wants what we can give them. We want somebody who actually wants us, Amen. right? And it's the same thing with God. And so we found, we saw how God chastens us. And then last Sunday night, we went ahead and talked about how destructive sin was. Sin, we sit there and we think about sin and we're like, you know what, sin, shame, bad. You know, don't do it because you'll go to hell. But we fail to, for, to realize that sin is worse than the vomit that just falls on the ground. I've used the example of how disgusting sin was as if it were vomit. If somebody throws up on you, you're going to just stand there and be like, oh, that's, that's gross. No, we would want to sit there and wash that off of us, right? But sin is even worse than that. It would be like somebody, you know, some vomit gets on the floor and it's somehow radioactive or something like that. All of a sudden, all sorts of other things are going wrong. And an earthquake hits and everything like that. Buildings start falling down all because of sin. We saw what had happened to Israel and Judah because they chased after these lovers. And it wasn't because God was being mean. God doesn't have to punish people. All he has to do is slightly remove his hand from the situation. Because the only reason that we are not destroyed within ourselves, we do not destroy ourselves, is because of the grace of God. And so all he has to do is slightly pull back. And then all of a sudden, he's not the one destroying us. We are just destroying us. That's why it says in Psalm 107, verse 20, I believe it is, that it says that he sent his word and healed our what? Our destructions. It's because of our destruction. And so he sends that to us. He, he winds up, we, we are reminded of just how destructive sin is. But the whole focus of it was not so much as to try to get us down, but to realize that Jesus took that on his shoulders. 
how destructive sin was, he paid for that on the cross. Doesn't it say that he became sin who knew no sin? We think that we feel bad whenever we feel, we feel that guilt or whatever, whenever we've done something wrong. Imagine what Jesus, who never did anything wrong, had all our sins laid on him. That is a huge, huge thing. And he did it for us. That shows the love that he has for us. Today we're going to look at sinful fruits are cut off. And we're going to look at uh, Jose chapter 8, 1 through 3. First of all, we're going to go ahead and just jump right on in again. And remember, if you don't have like a pen and paper to write down notes, get get the DVD or ask Sister Cherry to print out a copy of what's on the screen. It's no problem at all. But it starts out, it says, Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Israel shall cry unto me, My God, we know thee. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. There's a few things in here. First of all, it says, Set the trumpet to thy mouth. Does everybody know what that means? And then he says, You know what? God is going to come in like an eagle. All right. It's not going to be some kind of slow thing or anything like that. And you know when an eagle comes in for the prey, right? Swoops in. It's not a turtle, right? Doesn't the day of the Lord, isn't it described as a thief in the night? A thief doesn't come in, you know, with a a slow little bitty, maybe like a cane or something like that. I'm, I'm here to, you know, take your stuff. No comes in, thief, thief runs in when you least expect it. And at least God has given a warning. But they also say, Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Have we heard this? Have we said that before? Hasn't Jesus warned about that? There's two main reasons for the trumpet to be blown. One, from the watchman who warns of an incoming enemy and for the people to take up arms and be ready to fight. When the trumpet is blown, the people on the wall, below the trumpet, when they see an enemy coming, and that trumpet is to warn people, hey, heads up, get your arms ready. Get yourself ready to fight. And then two, the other one that you don't hear too, too much talked about is for the minister of God, whether it be the priest, the prophet, the Levites, all those, uh, the, the one that God set as a minister, to call the people to the temple to take heed to a command. Which do you think that it is God is telling them to to, to blow the trumpet for? I'd say the second one. Because even if Israel goes ahead and takes up arms, you think they can fight against God? No. No, indeed. He is calling them and saying, pay attention. Because guess what? This is coming. He's telling them, you know what? When they were for the Feast of Trumps, they had the Feast of Trumpets. That's what they would do. They'd blow the trumpet. And the people who, if they're working in the field, they would come in from the field and they would listen to what had to be said. And so he's telling them, look, pay attention to what I'm saying here. But also, remember where it said that Israel shall say, my God, we know thee. So here he is, he's coming and uh, bringing the chastisement. And then all of a sudden they're like, God, God, hey, hey, aren't we pals here? What, what's wrong here? Why are you coming against me? You know how it's almost like uh, somebody, when you got to correct them, maybe a child or something, they're like, I love you, don't do this, things like that, you know? That's how they were. And Jesus even warns the same thing, Israel's vain swearing to the Lord. Israel's not the only one who vainly swears to the Lord. Amen. Jesus warns in Matthew seven twenty two through 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them the worst words in existence to ever have to hear. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There's going to be a lot of people on that day. It says many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord. Didn't we do this in your name? 
Didn't we preach and build many churches in your name? Didn't we even cast out devils? We had a deliverance ministry in your name. And what is he going to say? I never knew you. See, that's the difference between just knowing that, God, that Jesus is the Son of God and actually choosing to follow him. A lot of people think that just because you know that Jesus existed or just because you know about Jesus, it means you're automatically saved. No. You have to consciously give, you have to give your life to him. You have to enter into a relationship. That's the difference between religion, again, and relationship. Religion would be, hey, I know all the facts and everything like that. Relationship is, you know what, I know you face to face, almost like just like Moses said, or just like Moses and God was, right? It was that face to face relationship. And that's what he wanted from the start, isn't it? Let's look at verse four here. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and their gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. Does this sound familiar to to you as well? How many generations have we been setting up kings in America without God's approval? I'd say almost from the start. We don't seek him about it. It's all we look at the people and we decide, well, I'm going to choose the lesser of two evils. You know, I don't believe in choosing the lesser of two evils. I believe in choosing no evil. So I believe in in asking God, God, what do you choose? And that but that's what they were doing. They set up their own kings instead of sitting there going to God and seeking God for the ones that they want that God knew they needed. And what happened? They got themselves into trouble, just like we've gotten ourselves into trouble, haven't we? We've done that. And, of course, their silver and their gold that God blessed them with, they make their own idols. They set up government without God's hand of guidance and wisdom. And they put masters, idols, kings, so forth, over themselves, rejecting the freedom and guidance that God intended. God didn't even want them to have a king. Isn't that right? When they first started out, they looked at all the nations around them. And like, you know what? They got kings. Let's be like them. God, we want a king. And God was like, well, I've been your king. Are you, you realize what you're asking me? You're asking me to put some other person as a master over you. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to wind up taxing you. He's going to wind up taking your sons and daughters, sending them out to war. He's going to do all these things. I wanted to be your king. But here you are looking at everybody else, looking at the Joneses. And you decided that you wanted what they had. God has better in plan for us than what they have all around. A lot of us will go ahead and it's still the same thing, trying to keep up with the Joneses, isn't it? Ever since way back then, we look at somebody else and we're like, you know what? Hey, I like what they have. Instead of saying, you know what, Lord, what do you have for me? There's a good poem out there, and I've mentioned this a lot of times before, but it's really helped to keep my focus right. Is, and it wound up, God had, shown, had let me read it whenever I was, at old, almost first got saved. And it was talking about how others may, but I can't, but you can't. And it goes ahead and it talks about things like that. It says, you know what, God may allow other people to do this, but you can't. He may allow somebody to get away with this, but you can't. He may let this person build up, not get lots of money, but you, he may wind up keeping you at a low amount. He may wind up having you ask, as the Lord prays, give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't say give us this week our weekly bread, right? He may wind up causing you to rely completely on him because he has that cherished love for you. He wants the closer for you than other people. And so here we go. We always look at other people and we want their call. We want their, the things that God blessed them with it. instead of looking at and seeing whether, you know what, God, what do you have for me? And if we can just seek and, and, you know, stick with what God has for us, guess what? It is a whole lot better. Amen. We will have a peace beyond compare. Amen. And we, guess what? He will bless us beyond anything else. 
It may not be, look the same blessings as those other people's, but guess what? You're probably happier and more blessed than what they're feeling, all right? So be thankful. God intends freedom, but they set other things over them. How many times do we do this on a personal level? I need this thing, that thing, that person, this person in my life. If I can just go ahead and get these things, then I'll be happy. Lord, you just have to let this person love me or let this person into my life. You you just got to make them want a relationship with me. God, I know you set me free, but I have to go back and do these things. How's about that? We get set free from certain things, certain sins, especially addictions, whatever. And then one day comes along, the enemy tempts us, and we're telling God, God, I know you set me free, but I, I just got to go back to this. You don't have to go back to that. You've been set free. But that's what they were doing. They had been freed from Egypt, from a land that had a whole bunch of false gods. They were made free with God as their God as their king and everything. And they wanted to go back to the land of Egypt, basically. In verses 5 through 6, Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be ere they they attain to innocency? For from Israel was it also. The workmen made it. Therefore, it is not of God. It is not God. But the calf of Samaria shall be broken in pieces. There were the, what he's talking about in the calf of Samaria. There were two main idols that they wound up making. And one of them was, they were both calves, but they went ahead and they, that was their big thing. And it was, they had a calf in, of Samaria that they wound up idolizing and saying, you know what, hey, you're God. And that's their problem. That's what they were doing. So what God is saying is, you know what, that false lover, that false idol that you have, it's going to cast you off. You know what, you're going to be ashamed. The thing, the person, the thing, the whatever that we seek after for love and everything, God's going to cause it to where that hate, they hate us and then we get upset. I remember uh, several examples and everything like that where we pray for certain people and we want them, they, they struggle with this kind of, maybe they struggle with rejection and we pray that God helps them out and God winds up cutting off, out people of their lives and we go back and we're like, well, God, they're sad now. And God, God, on the other hand, is saying, you know what? I cut off something that was killing them. Yeah. And so we need to realize that's how God does it. If we have some kind of uh, leech on us or a tick or something like that, that's sucking life out of us. Got to get rid of it, right? Yeah. We can't sit there and say, oh, no, 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 don't take it off. We, we leave it on there. It's going to suck more out of us, right? Mm-hmm. Let's get rid of it. And God is able to do that. He's able to remove it. And that's what we need to pray. That's what I pray a lot. Even today, today, I will pray that, you know what, Lord, remove whatever it is, whether it's a person, a thing, whatever it is that is not good for me. That's why he says that, you know what, we're like trees, right? We're like vines or branches from the vine, right? And what does he say when when we bear fruit? He prunes us, right? What does pruning do? Pruning sits there and removes little bitty branches and everything that are are sucking the nutrients out of us. He removes that so that we can flourish more in the areas that are actually growing. And so we ought to be thankful whenever he does this stuff. But it's just so funny that you think about it. that It says, for from Israel was it also. The workmen made it. Therefore, it is not God. They're sitting there making these things, and they're worshiping it, saying, you know what? I just made you. You're awesome. Let me serve you. Let me bow down to you. How's about this? I just made $200. Let me bow down to that $200. That happens a lot. People are moved and controlled by money. And you know, that's a big problem is that, you know what? What does the Bible say is the root of all evil? The love of money. Doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. All it says is it talks about how those who do have a whole lot of money, they will have a lot of temptation. And they will have to really watch themselves. 
but the love of money is the root of all evil. The idols and masters, the work of your own hands can no longer help, but now will cause you more pain. And praise God for it. Your sin that you invested so much of your life to is again no longer going to work. Again, this is almost, it reminds me again about addictions. They start out small and it, it was a little bit works, right? Brings them to the high, gets them whatever the feeling that they're wanting. But then over time, it needs more and more and more and more because it's not working anymore. And again, that's like the grace of God where he's saying, you know what? Hey, I'm going to make it so that you know what? You get to a point where you look back and you realize how far things have gone that you desire to return. When it was just a little bit, you were comfortable with it. It was okay. It wasn't too bad. But now you're in such a big ditch. Now you realize what has gone on. And so I'm calling you back. Come on. This reminds me. Unless the Lord is behind it, Psalm 127, verse 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. The reason that it reminds me of this is because, you know what, we will go ahead and work on something. And we will basically say, you know what, this is for God. But God never wanted us to do that. In fact, it was our own deal. I've had times whenever I've had to refuse certain offers and options and doors and everything like that because God was not in it. Just recently and everything like that, I was actually thinking for a while about letting somebody, uh, one of the, some minister and everything like that know to give me a call and all that stuff. And, and right as I was about to, get, to do that, the Lord says, no, that ministry has too much flesh in it. I've called you to something else. And so he wound up, he had to stop me from doing that. Why? Because it would have been fleshly. It would have been involving myself in an area that we, I think was okay. But guess what? God was not behind it. And if we go off and we do what we want to do, we may work for a little bit. It may work out good, pretty good. What happens after a while? It comes crashing down. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. In verses 7 through 8. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If so be that it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. Take note there how it says Israel is swallowed up. Why is Israel swallowed up? What does he say in the verse before? If it bud, it's going to be swallowed up. So in other words, he's saying, you know what? He's going to cut off this, the, the fruit that's coming up. He's going to make it so that all this, this pleasure that you used to have in chasing your lovers, not going to work anymore. But even if you do happen to get some pleasure from it, it's going to be taken away. It's going to be swallowed up. The moment that you get it in your hands, it's going to slip right on through. And so he says, you know what? Israel is swallowed up. Apparently they were, blood, they were still getting something. But guess what? They were being swallowed up. By who? Strangers. Those outside of Israel. God intended his people to be well favored in the eyes of the people, didn't he? He intended Israel and he intends us to be well favored, right? He talks about that. He talks about how he intended Israel to go ahead and be basically the, a jewel in the midst of the Nile, basically. You know, the jewel of the Nile and everything. People would just, the, in the nations around would see them flourishing and they, they would say, you know what, you are a blessing. Not only to God, but you, not only are you a blessing from God, but guess what, you are blessing us. You are not only building yourself up, but you are blessing and building us up as well. But what does it say that God says that is going to happen? Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. That's what happens when we go ahead and we get involved in the sin and everything like that. The favor of God no longer happens. The favor is taken away. Seems like people can't, hands, can't stand us. 
Before, when we have the favor of God, people can go ahead and say that they hate us, and yet they'll still work with us. They'll sit there and still bless us. They'll still wind up doing it, and they won't even know why. But whenever we get involved with all the mess that we get involved in, it ain't there anymore. They wind up hating us and beating us up. In verses 9 through 10, for they are gone up to Assyria, Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim hath hired lovers. Yea, though have they have hired among the nations, now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes. So what's going on? And they're chasing after those lovers again. They're still chasing after them. The only thing, problem now, apparently, what, what, is, what did Ephraim do? Hired lovers. God cuts off the, the beauty in their eyes and everything. The people don't love them anymore. So what does Ephraim do? Hey, I know, I know you don't like me, but hey, let, let me give you some money to like me. He's trying to force the issue now. But God says that's not even going to happen. Unpleasurable. Now they must hire le- their lovers because it doesn't come easy anymore. The favor ceases and now one must convince others to be favorable to them. Apply that to our own lives. We see that it's not working out. We see our sin is getting us into trouble. We see that the lovers that we were chasing after no longer give us anything. And yet... Instead of turning around immediately and saying, you know what, this isn't working anymore. Let me go back to God. We try to force the issue. I know I've done that in the past. I've tried to force it. I'm like, you know what? No, I'm going to make this work. And that's what they were doing. But you know what? God said that he's going to wind up getting, making sure that they fail. And that's his love toward us, isn't it? That is how much he loves us. In Hosea 8, 11 through 12, because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Ephraim made many altars, right? What are altars meant for? To, through worship, right? And he says, you know what? Because he's done that, all those altars are going to be sin. Instead of, you know, the the action that they're doing on the altars is sin, even the altars themselves are going to be sin. Doesn't this remind you of what it says in James 4, 17? He that knows to do good, but doesn't do it, to him even that is sin. Even the fact that you don't have to do the wrong thing, but just not to do what you're supposed to do. That is sin. And that's how it goes. That sin is multiplied Even the very choice to sin becomes a sin. And the second part, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Reminds me of 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 15. Why do you think that it was counted as a strange thing when he writes writes his law to them? His law is great. His law is not don't do this, 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 don't do this. His law is, uh, is life. His, is a good picture and everything like that, a, a good comic again, about how they have these two men, they're standing on a, in, uh, right next to what looks like a fence, and it sa- the fence has uh, on it, it says God's commands or God's law. And one of the guys goes ahead and he says, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm not going to be bound by God's laws. So he jumps over the, f- he says, I'm not going to be fenced in by God's laws. And so he jumps over. But right in the middle of his jump, the other guy says, wait, that's not a fence. And he shows the next panel that says it's a guardrail. And it's a it's a cliff. That's how it is. It's not a fence to keep us in to lock us in. It's a it's a guardrail to keep us from falling off and to our death. That's how God's laws are. But whenever he winds up trying to tell Ephraim this. He's looking at it like, what in the world is this? I don't understand a word that's being said. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 15, the reason for that, the reason that it was strange to them. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. 
I tell this a lot to people lately, especially about how you cannot approach the Word of God with the natural mind. And you cannot read the Word of God to a natural mind and expect them to understand it. The only way that you can do that is by only if you pray that the Holy Spirit gives them understanding. So you can't sit there and get all upset whenever the world misinterprets the Bible because you know what, guess what? They can't even understand it. I think I told Brother Farron this, uh, I, I might have even told it to y'all and everything about how the, I had seen a video, uh, this news clip, where some lady was talking and complaining, I think, about Ted Cruz because she said that, Ted, you know, Ted Cruz said something about it's time for the body of Christ to rise up and to support him. And she starts complaining and saying, I don't know who takes their religion seriously or anything like that, but for Ted Cruz to go ahead and believe that Jesus needs to rise up from the grave and serve him and everything like that is ridiculous. And I, I heard that. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> she doesn't understand what in the world was going on. First of all, Jesus isn't in the grave, all right? right. So the, she, but she did not understand that he was talking about the body of Christ at, according to the Bible, how the body of Christ is, the people of God. But, of course, she had that natural mind. She didn't, doesn't have the Holy Spirit telling her and explaining it, and much less, I doubt she's read it ever in the Bible to begin with. But that just goes to show how ridiculous things can get when a natural mind tries to understand something that is spiritually discerned. And that's what was happening with Ephraim. It was strange to him. God was saying, I love you, and he's sitting there like, what? What is that? God, you said, what? You hate me? It's the, exa- the natural mind twists things, and guess what? The devil is right there, very eager to twist it even more. In Hosea 8, 13 through 14, they sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it, but the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt, for Israel hath forgotten his maker. And buildeth temples, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. They go ahead and they forget about God. You know, our kids today are being taught there is no maker. They're growing up being taught this for many generations now to where, you know, it's, it's very easy for people to believe in evolution. There is no maker. To the point where it becomes ridiculous that, you know, even scientists are more eager to believe that aliens seeded us here on earth and then we evolved rather than God being the creator. They will believe anything. At least one time, the the king of evolution and all that stuff, Richard Dawkins, once finally admitted and said that, you know what, God could appear to me uh, 7,000 feet tall as a big old man and everything like that, and boom, out to in front of me saying, I am Jesus, and I still won't believe him. That's it. And at least he was honest enough to say that, you know, it's got nothing to do with proof. It's all about the fact that you don't want to believe in God. You don't want to serve God, because that makes you accountable to something. But that's what happens. And we have people growing up like this. That's why we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to, <clears throat> to teach people, to teach the kids and everything, to teach the adults, to undo, to break down what the devil has built. Yeah. We need to sit there and pray that the Holy Spirit of truth goes into their lives and opens up and gives revelation. We need to be prepared. It's a war, and yet a lot of people, are, it's a battlefield and everything, but a lot of people are thinking that it's like, you know, no big deal. They can sit in their recliner, watch TV, and they'll all be fine. We can't be like that. <clears throat> but Judah hath multiplied his fenced cities. And yeah, you know what? Hey, he's sitting there building up fences around his cities, thinking that that'll stop God. Is that going to work? No, God's going to send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. In, ver- in chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy, as other people. So don't be all happy like other people, because guess what? I'm correcting you. 
It's okay to cry whenever you're being corrected. In fact, you need to. You need to sit there and weep in tears and dust and ashes and everything like that, like, the, like they always did. Rip your clothes and everything and say, you know what, well, I'm sorry, God. Beat yourself on the chest and don't even look up like the guy did uh, that Jesus talked about who, with the Pharisee and that other guy. Say, I'm not even worthy of looking up. That's what you call repentance, Amen. true repentance, Amen. not, oh, my bad, God, I'm sorry. Uh, no, but anyways, it says, for thou hast gone a whoring from thy God. Thou hast loved a reward upon every cornfield, corn floor. The floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. The fruit of their sinful works will not flourish. That's what it seems to be the whole, you know, sub, general subject here. The fruit of sin will not flourish. All this chasing after your lovers and everything like that, it's not going to work. This is the correction of God, and it is something it, that shows how much he loves us. I mean, if we could go ahead and we can stop, you know, do, if we could do the same thing for people that we love to get them to snap out of it, we would, wouldn't we? I mean, if we could go ahead and physically somehow make it so that they realize their, what's going on and everything like that and the, the drugs that they're into and everything, that all of a sudden, you know what, they can't get high anymore. If we could do stuff like that, we would. God is making sure that, you know what, all this stuff is not going to work anymore. Remember how God chastens, and part of it is removing the ability to be comforted by the false lovers, isn't it? <clears throat> If you look back and you remember how he chastens, if you don't remember, go back, reread Hosea 1 through 3. It talks about that. Or get the DVD. In Hosea 9, 5 through 6, what will you do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? Remember a while back whenever I explained the difference where it says that where God is correcting him and he says, your feasts, and then where he says the feast of the Lord, he, he says, your feast, because he's talking about their traditions and everything like that. He's talking about, you know, how you set up all these things and you're coming to my feast like they're your feasts. Here he's explaining that, what are you going to do with my feast? What are you going to do in the day of the solemn assembly? What are you going to do when my feast comes along? He's not talking about their traditions. He's talking about, you know what, I want you to realize this is my feast. Your traditions mean nothing to me. For lo, they are gone because of destruction. And what destroys? Sin. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. And this is not talking about Memphis in here, okay? In, in Tennessee, is it? All right. This is talking about Memphis is an, old, an, an, an ancient city. I think it might actually still be in existence in Egypt. But it's talking about how, you know what? Egypt's going to wind up gathering them up. Memphis is going to bury them. The pleasant places for their silver... Nettles shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles. It's going to be in ruins. The places where they were supposed to gather for the feast of the Lord, it's going to be in ruins. Egypt's going to come and take it because, you know what, there was gold there. And guess what? It's going to be overrun with nettles and thorns. The places that they thought were so great and everything like that, that made them something else. God's going to wind up real, making them realize, you know what? You may have this place, but you don't have me. You may wind up having a, a great church building and everything like that, but you aren't worshiping me in it. You're worshiping yourself. You're worshiping your idols. You're worshiping all these other things. So I'm going to make it happen that, you know what, hey, the stained glass is going to rot. <clears throat> Their tainted sacrifices and tainted worship will not be accepted come the Feast of the Lord. We have a Feast of the Lord coming up, don't we? Yeah. Anybody remember when it is? <clears throat> 23rd of April. Brother Farron knows. I know too because I had to wind up looking it up once because the other day somebody said, oh, the oh, Good Friday is uh, here. And I'm like, wait, what? I, I, he, he got me because I didn't even pay attention to what day it was. But it's coming up. Rather, the places that they gathered for the feast, they will be brought, they will be bought up and neglected by Egypt. <clears throat> Egypt isn't going to go ahead and take care of that. Egypt isn't going to shine the floors for them. You think the world will wind up 
taking care of the things of God? <laughs> no. The very place that they were set free from, their former masters that they were freed from, are back to be their current masters. And they chose it. It's not that God was forcing it on them. Guess what? They chose it. When somebody starts feeling the effects of sin, don't weep for them. God allows that so that they wind up waking up. When somebody overdoses or somebody starts getting the shakes and everything like that because they're addicted to drugs, don't weep. Make sure that they're getting help. Yeah, I'm not talking about that. But guess what? That is God sitting there trying to get them to realize that, hey, something is wrong here. Something needs to change. And then that's where they get brought to repentance. Once they realize somebody will not repent until they realize that they need to repent. If they think they're all fine and dandy, you think they're going to repent? No. That's why you can't. If somebody doesn't understand the concept of sin, you can't explain to them, oh, come to Jesus. They're going to look at you and be like, "Uh, why should I come to Jesus? I haven't done anything wrong. Jose 9, 7, the days of visitation are come. The days of recompense are come. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is mad for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred. Even the spiritual people, they go insane. Sin drives even the spiritual people insane. You are not exempt. I consider that, you know, us here in, the, in his house, Tabernacle, we're, spir- we're spiritual, right? We're sons and daughters of God, right? We are not exempt. If we allow sin to enter into our lives, guess what? It, it will affect us no matter what. A multitude of sin leads to even the spiritual becoming mad. <clears throat> I'm sure we've seen this. Has, have you ever heard a TV preacher or prophet say something and think to yourself, where in the world did he get that from the scriptures? I sit there and I, I talk to some people who go to church here in town and everything, and they say the strangest of things. And I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? Where did you get that? I've mentioned before about a, a sister and everything that we all know who once told me that the, the vision that uh, I think it was either, it might have been Ezekiel and, or no, Isaiah, where the vision of the uh, four creatures and everything, or the cherubims with the wheel within the wheel and everything. I can't remember. Anybody remember Isaiah or Ezekiel? Ezekiel, Ezekiel? okay, thank you. <laughs> but she went ahead and told me, well, Ezekiel was, he, he was probably seeing a UFO. And I'm like, are you serious? It even says right there in the scriptures, this was a vision of God and there was the angels and everything. And you're going to go ahead and say that this was probably a UFO. And that's what we see happen. You know, we see this happen to people whenever they go ahead and they they get that sin in their hearts and in their lives. And then it just multiplies to where the fact that, you know what, they can't even see straight. And they say the craziest of things. In Hosea 9, 8 through 9, but the watchman of Ephraim was with my God. The watchman was, he was with God. He was good. But the prophet is a snare of a fowler in all his ways and hatred in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Therefore, he will remember their iniquity. He will visit their sins. The watchmen were for God, but then the prophet was a snare. Anybody remember Isaiah, I mean, Hosea 5, 1? Yeah. Where it talks about Mizpah. Yeah. Anybody remember what the word Mizpah meant? I don't have it written down, so. Watchtower. And what happened with the watchtower? What did they do to it? They were a what to the to Mizpah? To what did they do to? It says that they were a blank to Mizpah. In Hosea five one. It 
In Hosea 5, 1, it says, Hear ye this, O priests, and hearken, ye house of Israel, and give ear, O house of the king. For judgment is toward you, because ye have been a snare on Mizpah, and a net spread on Tabor. And doesn't it say right there how the watchman was good, but the prophet is a snare and a fowler? He's referring back to that. See how it's, it's, it's nice to go ahead and look into the Hebrew and see what the meaning of the word Mizpah was, which it meant watchtower, a place for the watchman. And it, but then it's not exactly important because he's explaining it right here. He's explaining that, you know what, they were a snare to those who were on the watchtower. He was a snare to them. He was a snare to the Mizpah. He was a snare to the watchman. What happened that was so bad in Gibeah? Anybody remember that? Or anybody can guess at that one? That's a tough one. You almost have to look that one back up again. And it's in Judges 19 and on. What that's talking about is when a guy goes ahead and he's traveling. And he ends up in Gibeah. And this is a place in Benjamin. And they go ahead and they, he's uh, one of the kind people. Let him stay there. And then next thing you know, the house is surrounded by people. The house says, you know what, to get, it's almost like a lot situation. They're sitting there banging on the door trying to get them and say, you know what, let us know these people. Let us know this uh, traveler. Let us sexually molest him. And then he winds up trying to convince him otherwise. But what happens is basically his concubine is given instead. They kill the concubine because of how much they abuse her. And then he winds up cutting up different pieces of her and everything the next morning when he finds her. And he sends it out to the people across Israel and everything. And then they wage war against the Benjamites because they, would, they refuse to, to send out these evil people. They're like, you know what? Hey, they're part of us. We're going to go ahead and stand up for these people. Instead of casting out these people and everything like that, there was a big war. There was a big battle and everything. But they didn't wipe, entirely wipe out Benjamin. That's in the tribe of Benjamin. If they did, there probably wouldn't have been a Bethlehem because that is in Benjamin. But ever since then, it's like they've just gotten worse and worse and worse because sin was introduced into the camp and it was not eradicated entirely. <clears throat> but back to the watchmen. How many times have you, and you know, God tells, I can give examples of my own life and everything about how God has given me warning to certain people and everything. Then someone else comes along and says, you know what, well, maybe God actually didn't mean that. Maybe he meant something else. And it ruins the word of warning. That is what they were doing. The watchman was good. The watchman was warning Israel whenever something was coming, whenever the enemy was coming against them. And then here comes along the, other, the prophets, the priests and everything like that coming and being a snare to that by injecting their own thoughts and everything like that by sitting there saying you know what hey maybe God actually didn't mean that he want God warns about that in Isaiah and Ezekiel both about how you know what hey there's prophet false prophets who are saying peace peace whenever I'm telling them get ready war is coming get ready I'm about to correct you oh no no God isn't mad at us he's a snare to the that and he winds up ruining it we see that today, Amen. and we need to watch out that, first of all, that we don't wind up doing that. If we hear somebody giving a word, a, a word of warning or a word to anybody else, don't sit there and say, oh, oh, well, uh, maybe God means this. Unless the Holy Spirit gives you an interpretation, do not say a word. Do not change, do not add, do not subtract. Because guess what? That word is important that's being brought forth. And if God is using us to give a word, do not change, do not add, do not subtract. Because we cannot afford to be a snare on the watchtower. God gives us a warning for somebody. Do not change, do not add, do not subtract. Do not inject your own thoughts into it. If you have to, like, we, like has been mentioned a lot of times, write it down word for word so that you have it right there so that you can't think later on, well, did I see this? Did I do that? Whatever. And what was it? No, write it down word for word so that it is solidified, basically, so that you can go back to it and say, oh, that's right. I didn't say this word. I said that word. Oh, OK, that, that's what it was. It wasn't this. I thought it was, but this is what actually God said. They were doing that, and we see it happen today. 
It is the same sin. It's changing God's word ever so slightly that it ruins people. When a town does not have a watchman who can give a proper alarm sounding, the enemy comes in. In Hosea 9, 10 through 11, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time, but they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves under that shame. And their abominations were according as they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth and from the womb and from the conception. God sees us so favorably when no one else cares. Everybody remember Ezekiel 16. I've said that so many times. That, that is a, huge, a wonderful chapter where it explains just how God saw us. A baby left open in the open field. Newborn, still covered in blood. Still covered in the, uh, in the juices and everything like that, the, the liquids and everything. Nobody cared for us. That's how God saw us. And he walks past us. Nobody else cares. They, they just threw us away. And God says, you know what? Your time is a time for love. Live. Don't die. I'm not going to let you die. He takes us up, cleans us up, gives us uh, his own robe. And he makes us beautiful. He makes he. He raises us, basically, to be the crown jewel. Everybody looks around and sees how wonderful things are. That's how much God loves us, and that's how he saw us. We often get upset and everything like that, and we say to ourselves, it's a good thing that, God, that we're not God because we would wipe people out. And it's true. I mean, I say it a lot of times, too. But then I'm also reminded of how it says, he remembers we are but dust. He looks down and we aggravate him, I'm sure, yeah, definitely. But then he also remembers, you know what, we're but dust. We're tainted with sin. We need his grace in order to get out of this. And so he sends his grace to get us out of it. It's for us to choose to get out, but he makes every opportunity for us to get out. Just like he did with them. But they chose others instead of God. Therefore, the conception of the lovers and God-given glory will be taken away. The only way that you can enjoy anything is because of the grace of God. And so all he has to do is remove a little bit of his grace and you can't enjoy it anymore. The conception, the the offspring, the, the fruit that is being talked about here. That's all he's talking about. He's talking about that. So in the next verses and everything like that, where he's talking about the fruit of the womb and everything like that, not just talking about babies. He's talking about the 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 the, whatever it is that the you and your lovers are are conceiving. You know, the the conception of the sin that you are involved in, the God given glory that you have, is taken away. He glorified Ephraim. He gave glory to him, didn't he? Made him shine like the stars. But that was taken away because he was misusing it. In Hosea 9, 12, Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them, that there shall not be a man left. Yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. God's departure is the departure of life itself. It's not, again, it's not that God has to do certain things. God is not slapping, God is not possessing this guy over here to beat me up. No, all he has to do is remove that protection. And guess what? The enemy loves it. Guess what? The sin that we go ahead and we have in our life, it destroys us. And we bring it upon ourselves. Do you remember what Cain's complaint toward God's judgment was? This always stood out to me. Even Cain understood it. When Cain was judged by God, God went ahead and said, you know what, leave. And what does Cain say? The burden is too great. You're you're telling me to leave from the very presence of your face, the very presence of God. He knew how, how destructive that was. 
And it's the same thing. If you go, I think that's in uh, Genesis chapter 4, if you want to write that down or go read it and everything. Where it talks about that. It says that, you know what, hey, he, he even understood that. Before he was cast out, they had the presence of God right there. And also, if I remember right, all the male lineage from Cain got destroyed. There is no lineage because come Noah's ark, come Noah's flood, that was wiped out. Because if you follow the genealogies and everything like that, that was wiped out. So he, he faced the destruction of his sin. <clears throat> he wound up having to leave the presence of God. That's why it is, I, I, I've said this before in the past and everything like that. The, the worst thing that Jesus, I could imagine that Jesus felt, it wasn't the nails through his hand. It wasn't all the beating and everything that he took. It was whenever sin was placed on him, when God turned his back on him, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I like to think about that because, you know, I love animals and everything like that, but also little kids and everything. And just imagine a little kid or an animal being beaten, innocent, nothing, did nothing wrong. And then some people just rob them and take them away from you and start beating them to death. And they're looking up at you and like, what, what, what's going on? What have I done to deserve this? Jesus didn't deserve any of that. And it's, that's the worst feeling. We think that we are alone. You know, God has left us. There's days whenever we go ahead and we cry out and saying, you know, we think that God has left us and all that stuff. We feel so alone. That really happened to Jesus. Didn't it? The, just multiply our feelings and imagine how, what he felt. In Hosea, that's why he says, woe unto them when I, depart, when I leave them. Woe to them. Because you know what? Hey, the protection over their children, the protection over the, the, their lives is gone. In Hosea 9, 13 through 14, Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is a plant is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give them? Give them a miscarrying wound and a dry breast. Tyrus literally means it's an interesting uh, word and everything like that. It means a man's head, but at the same time, the word is actually the same word used for rock. Isn't that kind of funny when you think about that, you know? Hard-headed and all that stuff, you know? Kind of makes sense whenever uh, God warns about people whose foreheads are harder than flint and all that stuff, you know, and they got a stiff, hard, uh, hard forehead. But it's, it means that. It means basically a man's head. But with the, being a rock and everything, Ephraim was seen as a good, he was in a good position. Top-notch place in, geographically. He was pretty well off, protected and well off. But now he won't even be able to bring forth the fruit from his false lovers or even nurture his current fruit. His current fruit, his current offspring, the, the current, you know, whatever blessing or whatever blessings I want to put in quotes here that he thought his lovers were giving him and everything. He can't even take care of them anymore. That's where the dry breast is talking about. You know, hey, guess what? He can't even take care of that anymore. Can't nurture them. It's being cut off. <clears throat> Hosea 9, 15 through 17. All their wickedness is in Gilgal, for there I hated them. Wait a minute, what? God hates? For the wickedness of their doing, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. Yea, they shall bear no fruit. Yea, though they bring forth fruit, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. My God will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him. And they shall be wanderers among nations. Didn't that happen to Israel? They got scattered, didn't they? Because they were as many times as God kept reaching out to them. They'd be good for a little bit, then they'd fall back again. They'd be good for a little bit, they'd fall back again to the point where, that you know what, hey, 
it got so bad that you see what's going on here. And they just did not repent. And we see even today that, you know, there are some Jews and everything who don't even believe God exists. Surprise, surprise. The Lord hates. Wait a minute. I thought that the saying was that there's one there's only one thing God can't do, and that's the, he can't hate anybody because isn't he love? Yes, God is love. But it also says that he hates. Let me ask you something. Do you think God loves Satan? Anybody here think that he loves Satan? That he loves the devil? That he tells the devil, oh, just repent. I'll, I'll, come, I'll bring you back. Or do you think that God hates the devil? See, God hates. He does. It says it in the word of God right there, right? <clears throat> A lot of people don't want to think about that because they don't want to think about the possibility that, hey, if God can hate the devil, maybe he can hate me too. Things like that, you know? The, and the enemy will put all sorts of thoughts into our minds and everything like that, make us worried and all that stuff that we committed the, uh, all, the unforgivable sin even and that we're the Antichrist, all these different things. I know he did it to me growing up a lot. God is love, but also just and true. When someone acts just like Satan, not just forsaking the Lord, but also corrupting those who do trust in the Lord, the Lord is more than righteous and loving when he hates Satan and his minions. When somebody acts like the devil, when they not only, just re- not, not only do they reject God, but they begin corrupting other people, that is when they, it gets to the point where he says, you know what, I hate. Because why? They, are, they have moved beyond just them messing up. They have moved beyond, and they, ha- they are becoming just like the devil. Do you think that, that God loves the Antichrist or something like that? The devil's possessing him and all that stuff, and then, you know what, God is like, well, hey, get out of him, Satan. Let me take him back. No, these things happen. Reality is, not everybody makes it to heaven. Yet when it comes to us, his desire, he desires to pour the love back onto us, when? <clears throat> when we repent. Even though he warns about hating in here, and he says that he does, his desire is repentance. No. He doesn't even want the wicked to perish. He, he, he wants them to live. He wants them to repent. He, that's why he's do, going through this whole situation. <clears throat> in Hosea 10, 1 through 2, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. So the more they they got blessed, the more things that God blessed them with, the more they sinned against them. The more they used his blessings to build up altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. A divided heart is a bad thing to have. A divided heart means to go to God for the blessings, but then use those blessings to create some other thing to worship. This is what taking his name in vain is about, too. I've said this before. They would take his name in vain. That's why he warned against it. They would say, you know what? Hey, Lord, uh, I'm a Jew. Okay, I, I, I'll worship you and everything like that. And then turn around on the, you know, Monday through Friday. They'd go ahead and worship other gods. And then all of a sudden come the time whenever they got to face God. They're like, oh, I love you, Lord. Things like that. People do that today, don't they? Yeah. We usually hear the phrase Sunday Christian and all that stuff. But it's even worse than that now. On Sunday, they're not a Christian even on Sunday. In Hosea 10, 3, for now shall they, now they shall say, we have no king because we feared not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? <clears throat> the people knew that they were doing disobeying God. They say, 
We have no king because we didn't fear the Lord. We, ha- we, don't, we don't have what we, ha- what we used to have because we didn't fear the Lord. What can that person do for us? We didn't fear the Lord. He's bringing his correction to us. What can we do? They were not oblivious or innocent or poor, misunderstood people that God never warned <clears throat> and tried to get to repent. He tried, and he is trying more through the correction. I've noticed this, and I've said this to a few people and everything. I've noticed in the last probably maybe 10, 15 years, you, ever, you notice how there's not any bad guys in movies anymore? They're all misunderstood people. Seems like it, right? Especially Disney movies, even. Even the bad guys, they're just misunderstood. Something bad happened to them when they were a kid, and they were forced into this kind of a life. We've had that. Thank you. But I've noticed that about movies and everything like that, that people... I mean, there is no more bad guys. They're all just misunderstood. And then we have movies where they're focusing on the bad guys, talking, saying their side of the story. And I think that's a lot to do with how subtle the enemy is yeah. in changing the way people think over the generations. Give it a couple more generations, and you know what? Hey, we're already actually seeing it. Good is bad, and bad is good. You get thrown in jail for buying baby parts, but you get funded for selling them. <laughs> We've seen that recently in the news, isn't it? But he, he wound up, they're, they're, they were not some kind of innocent people who did not know that they were doing something wrong. When God corrects us, he warns us ahead of time. The Holy Spirit convicts us. We get that conviction, don't we? And then if we refuse to, add, to listen to that conviction, guess what happens? The correction comes along. So we can't say, well, God, you never gave me a chance to repent. Why are you being so mean to me? No, he gave you that chance. In Hosea 4, or chapter uh, 10, verse 4, it says, They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a, con- a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. They were taking his name in vain, right? They were saying, you know, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Anybody know what hemlock is? Uh, I actually haven't pulled up, but before this and everything, you understood what hemlock was? Hemlock is a very poisonous weed that grows overseas. They do have hemlock here in America and everything, but it's a different plant. Over there, the hemlock that's over there is a very poisonous plant. And if you think about it, it says that, you know what, their judgment springs up like a poisonous plant in the furrows of the field. What would happen with that to happen? What happens to the cattle grazing on the fields? What about the farms? Their very livelihood is now cursed. The cattle eats this poison they die right god is talking about the very livelihood their 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 cattle and their farms and everything like that judgment is going to be affecting them there's no way to he's talking about that he's talking about how you know what hey just like y'all uh can't handle whenever hemlock comes up guess what it's going to come up and it's going to be in the furrows of the field there In Hosea 5 through 7, uh, 10, 5 through 7. The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth Avon. Everybody remember what, what about Beth Avon? You remember what Beth Avon means? <laughs> remember how I like to explain the names and all that stuff, right? <laughs> yep, house of vanity. And then literally, it means house of man's work being added to the Lord. Again, Beth means house. So man's works being added to the Lord, that's where Avon is. 
But it says because of the calves of Beth Avon, that's where their images were. That's where the, that big, the major idolatry was going on is Beth, in Beth Haven. For the people thereof shall mourn over it, and the priests thereof that rejoiced on it, for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it, he's going to take it away. It shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to King Jerob. He's getting specific here now. <clears throat> Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. As for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water. People tend to forget about Samaria. But Samaria did have, they, they were the mixed breed, basically, you know. They, they, had, they were the Jews who went ahead and intermarried with the others. Against what, I mean, and it's not talking about interracial marriage. It's talking about interreligion marriage interfaith marriage in other words it's talking about you know what marrying somebody who believes in seven gods instead of the one true god that is the the type of marriage that god forbids not races or colors of skin or anything like that it's talking about you know what hey they they serve another god don't marry them they did it and that's where samaria came along but because they were, some, they were still linked with God's people, they received correction as well. That's why Jesus went ahead and explained to the Samaritan woman. She was from Samaria. They believed something different and everything. They believed uh, against what God said. But their beloved idols will be taken away to their shame, fear, and dismay. In Hosea 10, 8, the high places also of Avon. The sin of Israel, the high places of also of what? Avon, right? So it's not talking about just, you know, Beth Avon. You're seeing it. But so if you can understand what Beth Avon means, you can understand why he's saying, you know what? The high places also of them adding works to God, to the Lord, the sin of Israel, which is what? Them adding works to the Lord, them adding man's works to the Lord shall be destroyed. And take note also, several places, they talk about the high places that they worship. People tend to forget, where did Israel come from? Egypt, right? Pyramids, right? What were a lot of the pyramid-style buildings for? It was actually for worship. If you look at the history and everything like that, you'll see that some of them had flat tops and everything. They had altars built up on there. They were taking and carrying away the, the same thing that the Egyptians were doing. They had their own high places that they were worshiping God whenever God said, you know what, don't do that. He didn't even want them taking and molding and making altars. He, if he, said, he tells them that if you're going to make an altar, take regular stones and everything like that. Don't cut them and all that stuff. Don't make it out into something special. Why? Because you know what, I don't want you adding your workmanship to worship me. And so he know, he, he, that's why it's talking about the high places. Also of Avon, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up upon their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. The places that they thought that they were worshiping and all that stuff, the, the places that they decided to worship against God's will and their, their idols and all that stuff are being destroyed. So what do they do? Like, you know what, hey, I can't live anymore. He's taking away my, my idols. Fall on us, hills. Fall on us. Just kill us. Just get us out of the way. That's when you know it's bad. Remember the meaning of Avon, which we just talked about. Beth Avon, house of man's works being added to the Lord. This was Israel's biggest problem. In their pride, they began worshiping God on their own terms instead of God's terms. God said to worship them in this place. They said, you know what? Hey, this place is closer. Let me worship God over here. And we all talked about it in previous chapters and everything like that. They worshiped on these certain hills because the shade was nice. The trees had a nice shade. It was comfortable over there, so let me go over there and worship God. When God said, do this, they said, well, you know what? Hey, you know what? I can do it here. I get a lot of people who say, well, I can worship God at my house. Yeah, that's true. But did God say to worship God at your house? 
you got to worship God at your house, yeah, but you also need to go to church, right? Yeah. Do not forsake the, the assembling of yourselves together. And there's a reason he says that. Yeah. A lone sheep, a lone lamb and everything like that is easy pickings for a wolf. But somebody who is with a group of lambs, a group, guess what? Can be protected a lot better. But this led to the high places of worship instead of worshiping at the places that God said to worship. And they worshiped their own man-made gods instead. Everything was centered around their own works instead of doing what God said to do. They got too big for their britches. How many times do we... Uh, we can easily make the relation to Israel and America. We were set free. We were blessed. We have grown so much. We have been so blessed over the generations. And what happens? Get too big for our own britches, basically. And we, you know what? We say, you know what? Hey, God, we don't need you anymore. And then it's just downhill from there. In Hosea. 10, 9 through 10. O Israel, thou hast ascended from the days of Gibeah. Remember what happened with Gibeah, right? There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. It is in my desire that I, shall ch- that I should chastise them, and the people shall be gathered against them when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. In verse 11, and Ephraim is as an heifer, an heifer. I can never pronounce that word right. Heifer, heifer. Heifer, there we go, thank you, (laughs) that is taught and loveth to tread out the corn. But I passed over her upon her fair neck. I will will make Ephraim to ride. Judah shall plow and Jacob shall break his clods. Ephraim is like a cow. Again, we talked about what a heifer was, right? A cow, for those who don't know, that doesn't need a yoke because it's trained. The cow knows how to do the word, right? But because he refuses to submit to God, his father, pretty much, God pretty much says that he will put a yoke on him and force him to a discomfort. Ephraim shouldn't have to be, I mean, he, ought, he knows how to do the things of God. Israel, they were, Judah, they were, they were told the things of God. They shouldn't have have to have a yoke on them and God pulling them to line them up. Same thing with us. We know the things of God. We know what to do. We shouldn't have to have God yanking and pulling on us to try to line us up. Would we, I mean, it's nice to think about us as a child and God is leading us by the hand or that God is even carrying us. And it's good when we're kids. But when we know better, do you want to be carrying around your 40-year-old son or daughter? No, there comes a time when you, they got to walk, right? And so it's the same thing. They were, they were like a cow that knew, how to, knew what to do was right, but they didn't listen to God. So God says, you know what, I'm going to make you do what's right. I'm going to put a yoke on you. And Judah shall plow and Jacob will break up the hard ground. In Hosea 10, through 10, 12, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. That's a nice, nice verse right there. In all this time and all that stuff, it's, it's been rough. But here he is, he's saying, you know what, hey, you've sown all these things, all, all heck is breaking loose. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. If you sow in righteousness, you're going to reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord till he come and, and rain righteousness upon you. God, in his correction and chastisement, still desires them and us to repent and to get better. That's the entire reason behind all this chastisement. <clears throat> His jealous love over us to do whatever is necessary to snap us out of our crazy. When we start going astray, we need to be praying, Lord, correct me. Send whatever needs to be done to correct me. Because I, I would hate to find out come judgment day that I was out of line. 
Do it now while I still have a chance. In Hosea 10, 13 through 15, though, we, explain, we see that God is explaining here. You have, plowed to wick, you have plowed wickedness and have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. He told them, plow, you know, he told them, plow righteousness, right? Reap mercy, right? And then he's saying, you have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. And why? Because you've trusted in your own ways. Therefore shall a tumult, a tumult arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled, as Shalman spoiled Beth Arbel. There's another new name for you. In the day of battle, the, the mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. So shall Bethel do unto you because of your great wickedness. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. So he's saying, you know what? Hey, you have sown in wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have sown all these things. You have done all these things. And why? And so guess what? You're going to reap the, pro- the benefits of that. And he explains, as Shalman spoiled Beth Arbel in the day of battle. Remember that while it said, he said that, you know what? Sow in righteousness, reap mercy and everything. Remember, it takes a while for you to reap what you sow, doesn't it? It takes a while. If you repent and you start doing what's right, you may very well have to wait a while before you see the fruit of your repentance. You, if you plant a tomato plant, it's not overnight that it springs up, right? So if you sow in righteousness, you will reap in mercy. But you know what? Guess what? It's going to take some time. You've sown all these other fields. Now you have a harvest of iniquity. And you're going to have to deal with that. You may very well have to wait a while to see the fruit of your repentance. Until then, you'll have to deal with a mess and keep walking to the Lord. Beth Arbel literally means house of head house of control. You notice how Beth means house. We know that, right? Arbel means head house of control. Basically the top notch, the place that, you know, it was their big place. They thought nobody could conquer that thing. Shaman completely plundered their place. The place Israel figured at the time was their top place of control. And this time, Bethel will do it. And what does Bethel mean? House of the Lord. So he's saying, you know what? Hey, Shaman went ahead and conquered your top places. Guess what? I'm going to do it now. The house of the Lord is going to wind up conquering and overtaking this thing that you, this control that you think you have. Don't think that you have something so great and untouchable that God can't allow someone to come along and completely take it away. In the last couple of verses here, James 4, 10 through, I mean, 4, 4 through 10. That was the last uh, verse of chapter 10 in Hosea. It all reminds me of the church that James is talking about, the ones that were fighting constantly. He says in, verse, in chapter 4, says in verses 10, 4 through 10, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us to lusteth to envy? Do you think the Scripture says that the Holy Spirit that you have the, the spirit that's in you and everything like that, lusts and envy, you know what, they, there's that control going on. The Holy Spirit wants us, and then, and then our own spirit wants to give in to the flesh. Our flesh wants us, the spirit wants us. What's going on? There is a battle. But he giveth more grace. See, there he is. He, sa- he says, I know that they're but dust. So he gives us more grace. Wherefore, God say, and he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. 
I left that part in because you know what? That's part of repentance. You can't smile and repent at the same time. That's not how it works. That reminds me of the time whenever I've told you all about that and everything about how this one minister went ahead and set, had an altar call and this young lady one, comes up and, and he asks her if he wants to accept Jesus into her heart. And she's sitting there chewing on a big old wad of gum, I guess. And he's like, he, he, that right there shows she wasn't being serious. She was just going up. Probably somebody pushed her up there, you know. Maybe she thought, hey, I could say a sinner, quick sinner's prayer, get saved, and hey, I'm go, going to heaven or something. But it wasn't sincere. There was no repentance there. There was no nothing. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. God is all about lifting us back to where we are supposed to be. When we give ourselves over to these false lovers, when we give ourselves over to our flesh, when we give ourselves over to all these things, and it comes to the point where he has to correct us and chastise us, he's doing it because he wants us to repent and to run back to him so that he can give us the freedom that we truly have in him. All it takes is repentance. Simple enough, right? It's quite simple. But that takes being broken sometimes. And if that's what it takes, God will break us. And the Lord will heal, restore, and lift you up with so much love, you won't even know how to handle it. In Luke 7, 36 through 50, that's a good one to look up. And if you don't have it memorized, to look that up. <laughs> But that's the story and the account of where Jesus went ahead and the woman came and washed his feet with her tears. And the, the Pharisee goes ahead and gets upset and, he has to, and Jesus has to correct him and tell him, you know what, hey, her sins are forgiven. She had a lot of sins, so she loves me a lot. When God goes ahead and we have the, a lot of sins and everything like that, and we repent and he forgives us, that only causes us to love him even more. So even if you have a ton of sins, enough sins to stack uh, on top of each other and it reaches to the moon and back down again three times, guess what? That just means that if you were to repent and God cleans you of that, you'll love him more than anybody else in the world. That's why I tell people that, you know, what they, they sit there and say stuff about me and they're like, you know what, hey, I... I you, you just love God so much more than I do and everything. You have such a dedication to him. And I tell him, you know what the Bible says about those who love God, have a lot of love for God? It's because he's forgiven me of a whole lot. You may think highly of me, but guess what? It's all, <laughs> I have messed up so much. And that's why I can say today that I love God, because of what he has done for me and who he is. And how much he loves me to have done it to, for me. Does Brother Farron have anything to say or mention or add? All right, if not, as we go home and everything like that, as you go through the week and all that, remember just how much God loves us enough that he, he's, he's eager to have us repent, right? We need to examine our own selves because, it's, again, it's easy to point fingers and, say, and see the sin in other people. But when we look inwardly and we realize, you know what, hey, yeah, I do have this idol in my heart. I need to cast it down. Guess what? He's eager to say, you know what, thank you. Come back. Come on back. So examine yourselves every day, not just this week, but every day of the week, all right? And if you need to lay down anything, lay it down. Lay it down on the altar. Sit there and say, you know what, hey, God, I I'm sorry I've had this. I, don't want, I, I know that you have been correcting me or you've been convicting me. Let, you take this from me. And he will, and guess what? There's repentance, and that's all he's been asking for.